So, hey guys. Oh, wait. Hey guys. So, thank you so much to coming for to our first neuro webinar with Chinmayi Balusu. I am super excited today to be speaking to her about her research journey as well as in the field of neuroscience. And of course, this webinar is brought to you by Mindset Seed. So first of all, Mindset Seed is a note that aims to promote the adoption of a growth mindset in children. So we not only strive to advance education, but also care about their mental health as it is an alarming, a very important issue in um, today's world as well as in the pandemic where everyone is staying at home. So a few programs that Mindset Seed have is the Yet Has Power podcast, which Jumayi has been a guest on on one of the episodes and we absolutely loved having her. So definitely check that out. It is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. So absolutely check that out. Apart from that, we also have the mindfulness program, the neuroplasticity research team, which this neuro webinar is offered to. And apart from that, we also have close partnerships with the American Diabetes Association to provide multilingual information webinars. And to check us more out, uh, please visit mindsetseed.org or DM us or visit our Instagram page at mindsetseed. So let's get started. Um, yeah, so Chamayi, please tell us about yourself. Hi everyone, super great, to uh, super great to be here. You probably walked in on my science fair story, but I am currently in my second year of college um, at Columbia University in New York City where I'm studying neuroscience and medical humanities. I'm actually currently not in the city though. I am home in Northern California, hence the wonderful sunshine outside. Um, I am the leader of a nonprofit organization that's called Simply Neuroscience, and it is also based around neuroscience uh, from a framework of interdisciplinary education, outreach, and awareness related to the brain. So we really strive to create a platform for all students to explore learning about the brain. Um, and yeah, I've been involved with research for a few years now. I began in um, early high school and was a part of science fairs since middle school, actually. What's really interesting is my initial science fair projects were actually on the environmental science side. Quite an interesting shift has, you know, gone underway. But science fairs have been a very large part of my life. And last year feels like forever ago with the pandemic. But last, you know, May, I had the honor of attending the International Science and Engineering Fair as a finalist representing my regional science fair. Um, I also had the honor of being selected as a student of the year by the California Science and Engineering Fair, California is where I live. Um, and I am really excited you know, to be here today to share about what my research consisted of in the past, what it consists of now a little bit. And overall, you know, just share some actionable takeaways for you uh, to really get involved with research, figure out what kind of role it plays in your life and how to really get involved in the process from start to finish. Yeah, absolutely. We're excited to hear about it and, of course, your experience in research. So for our first question, how did you get involved in research during high school? The big part was identifying um, that I wanted to get involved in a very hands-on means of engaging with science content outside of the classroom. And I had been in touch with older students in college and such, and from what I saw, research was really a great way to engage with science in that, in that manner. So the first step was sort of understanding, you know, what exactly is research? Um, was it kind of like searching information up on Google kind of research? Not quite, right? So understanding, you know, what it consisted of, understanding the importance of the scientific method and playing into the lab setting, clinical setting, or even, you know, dry lab setting as well was really important. So exploring that a little bit, um, and getting in touch with older students really helped me understand kind of what to look out for, um, which we can talk about later as well. So the first step was really also trying to identify what exactly I wanted to explore when it came to research. And early high school, around that same time that I was getting involved in research a little bit was also when I was kind of stumbling across my interest in the brain. So 
neuroscience psychology, that was really a driving force in kind of what I was looking to learn about more. Um, I pretty much taught myself neuroscience during high school. I used to self-study a lot of times. I was enrolled in Coursera courses online, EDX courses online, all that good stuff. And so this was a perfect place for me to really think about neuro in the real world. And hopefully, you know, gain some personal insight along the way and maybe even, you know, develop something that could be impactful for other folks as well. So identified, hey, I really love neuroscience and I want to get involved in neuro research. Now, this is not to say that, you know, you can go into research blindly. That's perfectly fine too. Um, what's also very common is you start out in one path in research and you completely end up going the other way. Um, throw back to my environmental science to complete neuroscience shift. I still have no clue how and why that happened, but it happened. So it just goes to show you that, you know, you don't have to go out on the path that you initially set out on and kind of getting exposure to different branches in a field or different, completely different fields too is perfectly welcomed in research. So putting that out there, <laughs> you can feel lost, but know that you want to get involved in research and that's also fine. That's something that you learn a lot about in college is exploring, it's fine to be lost at times. Now for the actual, how did I get involved part? A lot of cold contacting and a lot of searching on Google. We love Google. Why is because there is so much information out there that if you use the right keywords, it's available for you just at the touch of your fingertips, right? And it's free. That's something that's not really common to a lot of places. So take advantage of Google. Tips for keywords that I just mentioned would be high school research programs, summer research programs, summer research internships for high schoolers in California, in Michigan, in New York, wherever. Um, I also recommend checking organizations out. So just search up what are the large you know, science organizations in the United States? And oftentimes, even if they don't have like, formal research internships like you might think of, they may have different research challenges where you can work on developing a project solution with a team of other students. And that also is research in a way. You're working towards something that you know is novel. And that's truly at the heart of any research internship too. So cold contacting and researching, you know, background information gathering too. I mentioned look into summer research programs. It's especially very common for a lot of more structured programs to take place over the summer for high school students. Um, Oh, I'm blanking on the name of one. I think it's something along the lines of SSP or SIP. I can't remember. I think summer STEM student program. Um, I think Dr. Serena McCullough is the one who leads one of the virtual summer research programs. I personally did not, you know, attend. I don't know too much, but there are a number that you can come across in that way. Again, go on Google, my friends. Um, you also don't need to be formally involved with the program or a lab or a university of any sorts to get involved with research. I know a number of students who also, you know, they take um, a question that's popped up and they look into it on their own pretty much. I mean, you can use so many online sources on YouTube, for instance, to learn stats analyses, if that's your line, to understand how to format a survey, how to collect data effectively. Science Buddies is especially very wonderful website resource, so highly recommend that. Um, and to be honest, all of my middle school and early high school projects as well were completely independent. I didn't have support of a mentor really. My teacher would help me out with registering for the science fair, but it was completely on my own. So, you know, obviously, you know, <laughs> my middle school scale projects is, is completely different from what I'm currently working on at the moment, but at an introductory to intermediate level, it's completely fine to be working completely independently. And along the way, you know, mentorship is super important. So you can, you can completely learn on your own. What I believe mentorship can help you with is how to really present your results effectively. How do things come together? Helping you identify gaps in scientific literature, for instance, based on their own expertise. And how does, you know, how do science fairs and science research fit into the wider schema of things in your career, for instance? How does it fit into college applications and looking into what you want to major in college and looking into grad school even if that's what you want to do. Seems like forever away in the future, but having a mentor can really help you put that into perspective a little bit, think into the long-term. And research is really something that is meant to be long-term. One-time opportunities are completely okay, but it, I think research skills are something that pay off in the years to come. 
So even if you don't have a good experience, it's still important to not lose sight that the scientific method itself is what it is. So don't, you know, it's, it's difficult to say, but don't let one negative research experience completely change your perspective on you know, being a science student and conducting your own investigations. So, wow, that went quite a long track there. <laughs> No, absolutely. Amazing resources there in Science Buddies is definitely amazing. Um, yeah, and I cannot agree more. Independent research can be like definitely difficult at times. I did it my sophomore year and now I look uh, for a mentor. So basically just sending emails to professors and it's a different experience, but without my independence research, I don't think I would have gained the experience that I had. So I am absolutely on the same page. So for our second question, so when performing a research project, how do you select a topic to investigate? I think we kind of touched on this a little bit briefly earlier. Um, it's really a matter of you take your personal interests and you go out and look for a gap in existing knowledge. That's really easy to say. It's so difficult to actually put into practice. Now, I will provide the example of a project that I worked on previously, which was actually the project with which I qualified for ISEF. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit later too um, in this session. But what was going on was that my lab that I was working with um, was looking at the effects of a longevity compound, which means it's basically a drug that can extend lifespan in small organisms, such as mice, yeast, worms, flies. We actually had a fly that we named Eddie, side note. Um, so it can extend lifespan in a number of smaller organisms. And this drug was primarily being investigated in like cardiac muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue, um, adipose tissue, which is fat. Um, and so, you know, one day I was just thinking, you know, I'm a neuroscience junkie. And I'm thinking, why is this not being investigated in brain tissue? I mean, obviously my lab was also under the theme of sort of age-related diseases, neurodegenerative a little bit, but not quite. And so my question was, so many age-related diseases are also linked to the brain, either you know due to direct causes in brain tissue or molecules that have a direct impact in the brain or because they you know may spread to the brain or have effects such as dementia or memory loss or other issues as well. So I go up to my mentor one day and I'm like, doctor, what do you think about like, what is the role of this drug in brain tissue? And my mentor said, well, it's something that has not really been investigated much. And so I was like, is this for real? So next step you do is actually go confirm your suspicions. So I went through, conducted a literature search, um, which some of you might be familiar with if you're in like the research pathway right now is you extensively, you know, use different keywords to basically follow a chain of papers, academic papers specifically, not like news articles, science direct, nothing like that. Um, so went into existing literature and I actually saw that there wasn't too much and not on a scale that, you know, I was hoping to explore a little bit. So what happened then was that I, I, I sat down and looked into different protein pathways that were implicated with these age-related diseases and how they manifested in the brain. So specifically, I was looking for, um, what are the examples? I think it was Alzheimer's, Huntington's a disease that was called Alexander disease. I think it to myelin, I believe. It's been quite a few years. Um, so it was definitely, you know, looking at how these proteins play into the alterations in these diseases, whether it be mutations or complete expression of these proteins in tissue or a complete lack of expression. So basically, you know, are the proteins active? Or are they not? What are they doing? Um, that's what I was looking into. Just wanted to break down jargon as much as possible. Um, so I was looking for, you know, proteins that were implicated in these pathways and the next step was to test them out. Um, since I was on the younger side, I obviously did not get to work with actual mice. Very sad. Um, one day I hope to do so, but I was not handling mice of any kind. I was only handling their brain tissue. So the mouse, you know, the mi mice, mouse. The mice had received um, treatments with these drugs while they were alive. And so after they had died, I believe it was natural causes for most of them. If not, they were, um, uh, I believe, anesthetized English um, after a certain period of time. I'm not 
fully familiar with the protocols. There's quite a lot. Um, so, you know, I walked into the lab one day and there were tissue samples of mice brain tissue basically sitting in a nice little ice bath. And so we then ran a series of different procedures. Mostly there was one part is was tissue cryo homogenization. And when I say cryo, it's not the Captain America kind. Um, this is when you are basically these tissues are frozen to the point where they're so brittle. Um, and I believe it was liquid nitrogen. Yeah, liquid nitrogen is used to um, cryo and then homogenizing, basically mixing up the tissue into a very, very um, fine mixture where everything is integrated together. Bunch of tissue floating around basically. Um, and then later we ran a series of Western blots. I was running so many Western blots day after day after day because that's that was the essence. Now, basically what, what Western blots um, can show us are um, you think of like a little rectangle and I was comparing young versus old mice and how the expression was changing as they aged because age related diseases, right? So on one end was the young mice and on the other end was the old mice. And they were, I believe six different kind of wells or spots if you think about it on a Western blot for the young mice because they were six mice, I believe. And then old mice, same. And it was comparison, right? So the what we would ideally like to see from those kind of Western blots is a change in how exactly you know uh, prominent these different blobs are, terminology blobs. But basically, when you develop the film after you expose these different proteins that are outlaid on a membrane, uh, the membrane fluoresces. It's pretty cool. And you actually have to go into a dark room and develop film for it. But you take the film, it's about you know this big, and you can look at it, you can put it up to the light and you'll see blobs of varying sizes basically. And so the sizes of the blobs would give you an indication of exactly, you know, the, the area of it would be measured and it would give you an indication of how much protein was actually expressed. Sometimes, you know, a protein that was formerly expressed in the young mice would not be in the old mice at all. And sometimes it would be equal. Sometimes it'd be, you know, overexposed. So that was a little bit of failure also there. Um, some proteins that I was very, very, very hopeful about did not work out. Yeah, so maybe I was looking at the wrong protein in the whole pathway, because as we know, proteins don't just work. You know, I am the only protein associated with Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of different proteins implicated. And so maybe that one protein was just not the perfect one. Now, it was also really difficult to be able to go, you know, trial after trial after trial because each of these Western block procedures takes about two days. And that's for maybe two proteins. So you can imagine <laughs> it's quite a bit of trial and error. And that's fine. Um, failure is fine. Now, obviously, I was really thankful to be in a lab that had funding supporting this. But if you think about the feasibility too, that's pretty expensive too, to use that many you know, materials and um, from pipette tips to gloves to all the way to developing film and all of this. So, also touching upon the feasibility point there. You want to, if you are independently conducting a project, you want to be sure that you have the funds to support or you have the lab backing you for if you're interested in the wet lab setting. Now, if you're more on the dry lab side or you're interested in computational aspects, data, anything like that, there's so many open access databases out there. It is absolutely wonderful. Oftentimes when you also are affiliated with the university, like being a student, um, or you, if you are hired as a research intern, you can also be formally onboarded for some universities for access, then you can get more free data. Now, there is some confidentiality issues also, right? So for a lot of data that's related to patient populations, clinical data, there's also confidentiality practices, HIPAA that comes into play, right? So another point in feasibility is that you don't want to be dealing with sensitive information, especially when you're a minor. Um, and you're on like a local scale of working. So again, comes into play that having a mentor is so important because they can guide you through those steps. Um, and where were we last? Um, we'll leave off on the project description for a little bit now. Uh, we'll talk about the actual research mentor. Now, my mentor, you know, had absolute experience with working with this longevity drug. And they personally did not have too much of an inclination towards neuroscience, but they still had enough comfort to be able to point me to the right direction. 
Um, you know, even if they do not have any large outlines, that an outline different criterions of interest with me, they were able to say, this might be reasonable based on my past experiences and such like that. So if you're working with a lab, it's really important in cold contacting labs, especially, it's really important to consider where does their expertise lie? If you are interested in political psychology, for instance, and you are reaching out to a lab that is in biomedicine, that's gonna be a wild ride. So take some time into actually, you know, considering how a lab can accommodate your interests, or if you're going completely, you know, I don't wanna do anything with political psychology, even though it's my background, I wanna get involved in biomed, I'm doing it from scratch, I know nothing, but, you know, I wanna try this out, then you wanna be sure that, you know, you're gearing it towards the mentor who you're proposing something to in the right way. Um, a quick kind of subsection here is that if you are reaching out to a professor whose work is in a field that you, you, know, you have no exposure to previously, it might not be the most successful in terms of them getting back to you, especially at a young, uh, at a young age in high school. Not saying that it's, you know, there's a 0% chance that you're gonna hear back, but oftentimes, you know, even if you take a course such as biology in high school, even, you know, basic, you know, entry-level biology that we all take, even that can give you a slight edge over going into a bio lab with no bio course experience um, whatsoever. So just keep that in mind. Um, availability of resources, we've talked about, you know, data accessibility, like can they actually provide you space in a setting? So I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. It was so cool hearing about your lab and um, yeah, your experience having it in the lab with the materials also. Um, yeah, and I cannot agree more about the research mentor. So during the summer, I had to send out like 100 emails reaching out to different professors. And it is kind of a tiring process, I guess, because like there is um, determined determination within it because like some professors will decline. But like Chimayi said, definitely reach out to professors in your area. And I guess just share your passion. Why are you interested in the subject? I feel like passion and enthusiasm kind of outweighs your experience with it. Right, yeah. And I just wanted to add something in here really quick. Especially now, professors have a lot on their hands with you know lab moving virtually and such like that. So just as a disclaimer that, you know, COVID-19 has definitely shifted research. So do not be, you know, personally discouraged if you never hear back from anyone. <laughs> well, yeah, it is discouraging. I would like, it's not your fault. Um, as long as, you know, you put out effort into the world and you put out effort into reaching out and you don't hear back, um, it may be that there's also a lot going on on their side. So keep that in mind. Another quick point is a lot of summer research programs have are being canceled or shifted virtual in a format that may be odd. So just wanted to also put that out there. I just like was thinking about that. Third point very quick is to add on on what Ann was saying is that professors are busy, right? Grad students, graduate students, PhD candidates and postdoctoral researchers. So who are not the principal investigator of a lab, but you know, they're a the postdoctoral researcher with a PhD oftentimes Graduate students and postdocs are especially keen to take on mentors more so than the PI of a lab themselves, especially if they have a large lab. Now, when you are reaching out to labs, you're obviously gonna look, wanna look into what is the scale of a lab, right? Smaller labs will allow you to have more direct contact with all of your lab members, working group, et cetera. Now, they will also be busy because when you have a smaller team, a lot of responsibility falls on um, you know, the people who are actually hired and working. For larger labs, they may have more resources to take you on. And especially in high school, what I see is that there's this perception that when it comes to college apps time, it's so important to work with the PI of the lab themselves more so than, you know, a PhD candidate or a postdoctoral researcher, which is completely false. Um, I continue to work with graduate students in college and it definitely does not diminish any other value as a mentor. And, you know, I work with both graduate students and postdocs and PIs in the lab together. So it's not a matter of, you know, oh, I'm not gonna work in that lab because yeah, they said yes, but it's only a graduate student. Never have that mindset going in. Um, wow, I just referenced mindset. <laughs> that was unintentional, but there we go. Um, so always, you know, be, 
aware that when people open their door to you, that they're willing to take on a large commitment of time to support you. You know, they're not going to do a half but a job out there. So be considerate. Um, I think that's especially something that I see a lot of lacking uh, these days. There's a whole pandemic going on. So just please be considerate. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. Professors are super busy. Uh, yeah, I cannot agree more. Um, within my mentor, I also work closely with the graduate students in the lab. So that was definitely a great experience also. And yeah, definitely not less than the professor experiences. Yeah, so for our third question, I think Jumai kind of touched on, but please share with us your ISAF um 2019 project and for those who don't know i think isaf stands for international science and engineering fair yes yeah yeah perfect um hey that was me at isaf like last may when the world was still as we previously knew it but and isaf still have been in person um i started telling you about my project already with all of the little blobs <laughs> it's not technical terms um uh, don't take my word for it but came out of it with really a lot of understanding of what really happened in the wet lab. It's a world of its own, to be honest, um, when it comes to procedures you're learning or just the dynamic of how people interact. Um, who do you go running to when the thermocycler is being odd or the power has somehow gone off in the building and the thermocycler for your PCR is now stuck halfway through? And what's gonna happen to your samples i have no clue so you know who do you go running to in those situations you handle a lot of like slight crisis moments too which is really it's not interesting it's unfortunate but it teaches you some things um so anyways for the quick summary of what actually went down towards the end of my project i found there was this one master protein uh pgc1 alpha i'm not going to read its full name out to you because it's just i it's yeah anyways it's very long um, so PGC1 alpha was implicated in quite a few diseases. So that was a great point. And as for, your, as for implications of that, you know, rapamycin is the drug that I was working with and it has, it's very up and coming. It's, it's currently being used as an immunosuppressant, but you know, it's, it's properties and longevity are being investigated right now. And perhaps it is drugs like these that were not thinking about too much, at least in the past, weren't thought about too much as related to aging or longevity in any way that are going to be the somehow miracle drugs that can actually have an impact on, maybe it doesn't have to be the cure for these neurodegenerative disease, um, but even improving outcomes, um, improving health of patients, improving, you know, uh, dealing with side effects, anything like that, that can be really important. So that's kind of for the summary because um, like it opened up a lot of lines in terms of other pathways to explore with these diseases. Um, so that's kind of what happened, but this is like on the grand schema of things. That's why it's important. Um, and yeah, this was my, I, I participated with my project at my regional science fair. Um, as per my science fair story in the earlier part, I did not expect at all that I would qualify for ISEF with my project in any way. I was very shocked. I was very shook it. Um, and it was, it was a wonderful journey. Um, you know, I think science fairs at, science fairs in general, you know, regardless of local school, ISEF, state, any kind of science fair will give you such valuable exposure that is, that is important. It's just important. It's so important. And when you, and, it, and I'm assuming that a lot of you guys are also going to be interested in continuing research into college. When you get to college, you're also going to be able to attend a lot of research symposiums on the undergrad level and even on the professional level that you can learn about from other researchers, researchers, English work, and, you know, potentially present your own too. So science fairs don't just disappear after high school, they just turn into more formal symposiums and presentations and conferences. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, this really echoes the theme of like, it's a journey, not a destination for sure. Um, yeah, so it was incredible learning about your research and the brain tissues of mice. Um, I will definitely look into that later. Um, 
So now for our fourth question, how do you have any tips for being successful in science fair? Yeah, I would definitely say that it is completely okay to go outside of your comfort zone and explore a field that is completely new to you. And I keep getting ahead of myself because I'm pretty sure this is on the coming slides. Um, but so I, I obviously, you know, from high school, I was telling you about my experiences with this project and I had a biomed and a neurodegenerative disease background going into college. So you would think, yes, Chinmay, of course, you're going to continue something in this line, right? Well, no, that did not end up being the case. And I'm actually kind of glad that that was the case. So current, I am really getting ahead of myself at this point, but going to go with it. Um, so labs that I'm currently involved with, work that I'm currently involved with, is related to cognitive neuroscience, um, currently contributing to a project related to attention and memory interactions. So that was really interesting from more of looking at, you know, healthy versus disease states to more of, let's think about a function that's on the everyday scale, right? So that was, that was an interesting perspective to have. Um, also kind of learning, relearning a little bit of coding, I should say. I had a previous stint with Python a little bit, um, but I, it's been a few years. So I'm currently trying to get into you know, developing more Python and R skills. So hopefully, you know, a few months down the line, <laughs> if you reach out to me ever, I'll be like, I have now learned a little bit of Python. Um, that's a little bit on the cognoro side. Um, over the summer, I kind of dialed in a little bit of behavioral neuro. It involved a little bit more genetics, a little bit more computational, um, which was interesting. Complete dry lab, right? With the cognitive neuro experience, that was more of a in-person setting. Um, no chemicals involved. It was more related to a human study. So not like we're not, we're not putting chemicals in humans. No, sir. No, ma'am. But it was more so, you know, they would complete a task that was given to them with certain stimuli and respond accordingly. And so data would be gathered upon that. So, yeah, um, you can probably see it like a trend of all of my research experiences have been in sort of different settings, which actually was it equal parts intentional and unintentional. Um, I didn't go into it with kind of like, oh, I want to try out a different setting, but it kind of worked out well along the way. And then last but not least, another uh, project that I'm currently working on is related to brain injury, traumatic brain injury, specifically mild traumatic brain injury, um, which is one form of which is concussion. Um, that we're familiar with. Football, for instance, um, motor vehicle accidents too, unfortunately, um, many other causes. So currently looking at that more in a clinical perspective, clinical patient population perspective, um, which is again, is a completely new setting for me. So basically what I'm trying to tell you, even if I'm getting ahead of myself again, is that all of my experiences were slightly different from each other. Neuro is the base because I find that that is my comfort zone. That is what I'm most curious about too. But brain injury was not something that I definitely expected to be getting involved in when I was way back in high school working on this rapamycin drug project. It grew over time. It was an interest that grew over time. Um, please don't mind that that's just the security alarm. Um, so you definitely want to be learning about something that is exciting you and that you're always looking forward to. Right. If you're going to lab and you're learning about these proteins and you're like, man, I can't like, you know, visualize a protein sitting in my hand. Right. It's so minute. I'm not really interested. Then don't. Uh, or you can, you know, you can still continue to work there, but acknowledge that. Maybe this just isn't the place for you. And that's also fine to learn what fits you and what doesn't fit you. Um, moving on from that point, uh, it's also really important to develop um, your communication skills. And, you know, you don't have to be the best public speaker out there, right? Especially for a lot of us, we're on the younger side at Science Fairs. This is our first time that we're trying to present something that's a lot more technical. And, you know, it's not just, you know, your average English literature class. Here's what Huckleberry Finn did, kind of a presentation. But there's so much more complexity happening here. So building those skills can be through practice can be through knowing your work inside and out, right? You want to be meticulous. Um, every like Western law procedure that I mentioned previously, the blobs, think back to the blobs, you know, being able to understand why every step of that procedure is necessary was so important for me. At one point, you add milk in this procedure. And I didn't figure out why milk was added until much later. Um, 
and again, this is throwing back to a while, but I believe it's something related to antibody bonding um, for these different um, tissue membranes, uh, something about blocking um, the receptors, I believe. Don't quote me on this, it's been a while. Um, <laughs> but know your work inside and out before you're presenting and sharing your work, right? You are your expert on your project, basically. You don't need a PhD or an MD to be an expert on your project. However, it's okay to also not know something. My mentor obviously knows about Western blots a hundred times more than I do. But if you're working on something, really take time to learn as much as you can about it. Um, not just because the judges might grill you <laughs> occasionally, but also because that's sort of how you develop your scientific understanding. Um, classrooms are, and, and you know, textbooks of teachers are not gonna be able to teach you everything, unfortunately. It's just, it's not possible. The scale is not possible. So being able to engage with that learning a little bit on your own is gonna pay off in the long run. Now you can also acknowledge failure and be humble and that can take you a long way. Um, you want to be clear about when an experiment did not work out. You don't wanna cover it up. Science does not work that way and it can have negative implications. So be honest. If, you, if your experiment failed, if one of the proteins failed, acknowledge that. Um, one of my proteins for that was on my poster actually, was not a significant result, but I still put that on there to show that it was not a significant result. On the right side, something optimistic to look forward to. A couple of days after I actually submitted the poster, we ran the you know Western lot for that protein again, and it actually was significant. So maybe it was a fluke in data analyses, and you know one certain day that just uh, a certain tissue membrane or an antibody did not work out well, but it worked out. So when I was presenting, you know, I still had that non-significant result on my poster, but I explained that I later ran it and it was out of complete honesty. But even if, you know, you didn't get that second positive time around, um, it's fine to acknowledge that, you know, this was not significant, but here's what I learned from that not being significant, that this certain pathway was not the most um, implicated in the disease. So I shifted away from there. Um, and, you know, be humble when a judge walks up to you in a science fair and they have a PhD in your field, and they give you some pointers on what to think about. For instance, for um, this drug that I was working with, I was not too familiar with how to judge the scale of toxicity of this drug when it came to humans. And one of the judges at ISEF actually kind of took a moment to you know, stand there, not sit down, but stand, with, stand there and tell me about why this would be, you know, how would the implications play out in mice versus humans because they were a licensed you know, medical practitioner. So, and was that, was that bad on me? Partly, maybe I should have done more research on that. Um, but also, you know, understanding that level of toxicity is something that, um, give me one second, sorry. Um, yeah, so while she might fix that, um, I cannot agree more with what she is saying. Um, yeah, the science fair can be like a scary experience, like especially if you're not comfortable with public speaking. I had to personally rehearse my presentation like 10 times and I was like so monotoned and I had to like be more excited about my science research, my science project, yeah. Uh, so shifting it back to Shamayi's. I'm back. Sorry about that. My, my mom's phone just went off and I was like, oh, it's way over there. <laughs> um, so yeah, I completely agree with your point. Um, it, you can sometimes go off into like a monotone drive when you're talking about really technical aspects because you're like, yeah, formal, you know, science, technical. Um, but I think you're, oh my gosh, um, I can just mute this, but <laughs> your enthusiasm comes through and let it shine through. Um, you're doing cool science. That's pretty cool. So really, you know, let that shine. Talk about why this project excites you too. When people ask you, why did you do this project specifically? You can share about how you're excited about this and what it means for you in the future, you know, your future career plans, how it fits in, all of that. And since we know, getting close on time and I wanna make sure this space, um, you can also, you know, absolutely feel free to network as well at science fairs. This is the first exposure that you get, like I mentioned, in the future, you might be going to conferences. So practice networking with fellow young scientists. And I kid you not, you will likely meet some of these people another time in your lifetime. Um, I have met virtually and both in person, so many folks from regional, state, and ISEF. Some of them are actually my closest friends when I met them second time again. 
Um, so it's a bond. So let's keep that in mind too. Yeah, absolutely. I cannot agree more. I was actually friends with the person right next to me in science fair, and we still keep in contact until now. So it's definitely an incredible experience for sure. Uh, yeah. So for our next question, can you briefly describe your current research at college? Yeah, so I <laughs> mentioned this before. Um, kind of in three different veins right now. I'm sort of wrapping up the behavioral neuroside a little bit, but um, yeah, it, it definitely has been a little bit of a shift from my previous research directions, but I'm enjoying it and it's been wonderful. Um, oh, this was like on a slight side note. I just included this photo in here because I just thought it was a cool photo. It was at a neuro event um, through a school club that's called Columbia Synapse. And we were hosting a research landscape panel based around uh, traumatic brain injury treatment methods and current research, um, cutting edge research, to be honest. And this just goes to show, you know, one of those events that sharing research with the public is something that you can greatly develop those skills through science fairs. Um, and also thinking about how your research could potentially affect vulnerable populations, right? And positively impact their lives. For some of these individuals to hear from those researchers that day was, it was, it was wonderful. I mean, it, they just, fulfillment. I saw fulfillment that day and hope too. Um, and I think even as students, it was just so inspiring to see that the future of the field is, is the, the outcomes are just so positive. So we're always working towards bigger, better things in research. So at the end of the day, think about the people that you might be impacting with your very even minute scale research. Um, think about how these skills that you're developing on a day-to-day -day basis are going to translate into even bigger, better, stronger things tomorrow. Um, well, I'm getting like sappy over here. But I think it's so important to keep in mind future outlook um, and really, you know, work towards, as science students, work towards always bettering society. So important to keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I cannot agree more. The, no matter the scale of your project, like you mentioned, there's always an impact that it's going to make um, from maybe the person who looked at your board that day or yeah, maybe the judges, your students, maybe you can inspired someone. It like any project can make a difference for sure. Right. Um, yeah, so for our next question, what do you think are the differences or similar similarities between research in college and high school? Mm -hmm. Oh, and I just want to clarify this real quick. On, did you want to do uh, like questions separately after we're through or? just, you know, in the chat on a rolling thing, because I'm fine with either time-wise, what you would prefer. Oh, time-wise, we don't really have a time limit, so don't oh, really great. worry. Yeah, so don't really worry about the time. Uh, we will have a Q&A session if anyone has any questions at the end. Awesome, thank you. I know some webinars were like one hour short, and I can perfectly stay over as well, so wonderful. Um, keep rolling on. Uh, there on some levels, it's very similar in, in both um, educational aspects. On other levels, it's very different. Obviously the scale and the importance of conferences and research events is gonna grow a little bit just because it's you're now associated with an academic institution that's probably highly reputable. Um, your accessibility and support of mentors, I would say, there's there's a very positive regard of being an undergrad student who's, you know, you've kind of found your niche in the world through this college and you're now starting on on a more defined path. When it comes to high school students, some people are a little bit hesitant because they're like, are you gonna commit? Are you actually dedicated? Are you just a youngin who's gonna change their mind the next day? So, you know, you may have to project yourself even more maturely um, as a high school student at times, right? Not to say that you don't have to do that during undergrad, it's always important to be professional. Um, that's sort of an attitude or an atmospheric difference that you might see. Um, definitely a lot more flexibility in terms of what you wanna work on during college because there's a lot more support, both from the mentorship level, from the funding side as well with grant applications and the support that they can provide through a lab. And also that for a lot of high schoolers, summer may be one of the only times that you can actually put towards research. But in college, there's a lot of ways to get involved with research on a smaller scale, part-time scale. Some people do full-time scale, which is pretty tough. Um, 
but it's a lot more flexible to what you want to get out of it. And the big attitude difference, and this is for college overall, is that you're now an adult. So you determine your own schedule and your research mentors will probably adhere to that kind of a common sense thought in the mind that you now have an independent life in consideration. So what you put into it is what you're gonna get out of it. So you're not gonna be babysat in college basically. And you know, there's also a lot more ability to focus on independent research much more. A lot of mentors are I see that too in the culture shift is that they want to actually help you build something that is meaningful. And many are also helping to, to develop a skill that they can place on their CV, for instance, for graduate schools and medical school applications. And there's also the ability to, for some colleges, you can apply to conduct a senior thesis research proposal. So in the last two years, the last year of your schooling in college. Um, you can focus on an independent research project under the supervision of a faculty mentor for your senior thesis. So that's something that, you know, is built into the curriculum. You can opt into it and you might get it with honors at the end of your bachelor's degree too, which is really cool. Oh um, yeah, so that's definitely really amazing to hear. Also, I'm a junior right now, so I definitely look forward to doing research in college as well as taking my interest further, for sure. And so lastly, can you share with us the research opportunities and or resources offered by Simply Neuroscience? Yeah, of course. So just as a brief recap, because you're like, what is Simply Neuroscience? Um, so this is a nonprofit organization that I founded last May, and I currently lead as well. Um, it's, as the name says, once again, it's based on neuroscience. So as for research, we are currently hosting a research fellowship program that is geared towards undergrad students. And this is in collaboration with two, under, well, two other wonderful organizations. Um, we may be opening up future cohorts in the spring as well, but this is primarily going to be undergrad geared for the time being. However, um, we are looking to build an advising program that will be coming up soon. Our tentative launch date is about February 1st, I would say. So I would recommend, you know, keeping that in mind that this advising program will likely also kind of give you an option to explore research interests. Maybe not culminating in a project, but you will be able to talk about research more and chat about guidance a little bit more with a advisor who is a, someone with a bachelor's degree or above. Um, so I'll maybe graduate student, maybe industry professional, maybe a researcher, maybe a medical student, anyone in that lines. So, um, you know, and this is for you. Um, this is definitely a lot of time that we're investing. Um, I probably put in like 15 hours this week to try to get this together. Um, <laughs> so this is something that we're definitely all pouring our heart and soul into and we would absolutely love for you to take advantage of when it rolls around. So I would recommend, you know, I put this link on here and this is the SN newsletter, uh, SN for the organization's name. So when the time comes around and we make the big formal announcement, you're gonna hear about it through the newsletter if you sign up. Um, and it's really important to me too personally that you guys take advantage of this because this is completely free. Um, and this is for you truly. We really want to, you know, for those of you who are interested in neuro or maybe even don't have a solid interest in neuro but are curious, um, this would be perfect for you. Super low stakes, it's what you want to get out of it. Um, and it's, this is for you again. Um, if you have any sort of one-time questions that you're curious about, we don't talk about right here, you can always email this email address that's on here, advice at simplyneuroscience.org. This is actually a free email advice hotline for neuro students. And you could take advantage of it technically as many times as you want. Now, please don't spam us, you know, with questions that could be very easily, you know, defined by a simple Google search, like what is neurobiology? Please Google it. But any sort of questions about I'm having trouble deciphering, you know, this research mentor's website or like trouble approaching them, what to ask, um, things like that we can try to help you out with. So putting that out there as well. And last but not least, we have free educational content, you know, to self-study with on our website, simplyneuroscience.org. And if you are, you know, interested in seeing some educational neuro content on, our, on your feed once in a while, um, we regularly actually do research features. So we break down research studies related to neuroscience and in a simple language way, um, no jargon, right? We're easy to access. 
Um, you can also check out the Instagram page here. Um, completely educational content, guiding practices that it's here for you. Um, so whether it be, you know, neuroscience research, neuroscience anything or not, I'm happy to help out in any way too personally on the STEM side. Um, I will drop my email in the chat. Do, do, do. There we go. You can email me um, and I can hopefully, you know, provide you some support as well. I'm always happy to support younger students, especially science enthusiasts, science for buddies, anyone. So take, please take advantage of as much as we can offer, whether it be me personally or my organization. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, I went to your website and there's definitely a lot of amazing resources. Um, you mentioned this, the educational resource. I saw that there was a Quizlet to prepare for like uh, neuroscience or brain competitions. And that was definitely um, great to see. And there's also a podcast, which is um, definitely cool to check out also. Oh, this reminds me very quick. Um, the podcast, which is called The Synapse. So The Synapse. Um, they have a series that's called the College Neuro Network Series. And it basically interviews individuals, undergrad students and professors at various universities or who have graduated from the universities um, for a little bit of insight into what neuroscience looks like in colleges. Um, totally not biased. Um, <laughs> I, I shared about my experiences at Columbia in one of the episodes, but also, and one of my, my research mentor is actually um, one of the other ones who's featured from Columbia. But a lot of universities are, you know, the team is trying to cover them and provide insight into. So, you know, again, another resource for you to take advantage of if you are so inclined. Thank you, Anford. Thank you for reminding me of that. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so definitely check out that. It sounds really cool for sure to look into the college experiences. So I think this exhausts the slides. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or leave it in the chat. No question is ever a bad question. Yes. Um, so as we are waiting for questions to roll in, I think we did touch upon this during the podcast, but some area to definitely look into is um, the intersections between neuroscience and other fields. So I would love to hear some of your input on that for sure. Of course. So you can obviously tell that I'm on the neuroscience trade like every single day, every single minute. And this, you know, it's not just because I love learning about the brain, but because I'm, I, this is not cliche in any way. I honestly wake up every single morning and I'm in awe of how wide neuroscience is, how diverse it is. And it's, it's honestly incredible. <laughs> and why it's incredible is that neuroscience is truly for everyone in so many aspects because we don't necessarily, you know, we're focusing on science fair here, right? I'm assuming that a lot of you guys are maybe STEM heavy, research heavy, right? But you don't necessarily need to be a science junkie in order to be in neuroscience. Some random car over there, um, not the post guy. But anyways, um, it's really open to everyone because there's so many branches involved in neuroscience. And to name off some examples that I think are really, really cool, there is um, consumer psychology, the neuroscience behind why we purchase certain things, for instance, why we're driven to perceive things in advertising, for instance, um, in graphic design too, for instance. Um, why are some logos effective while others are not? That is also neuroscience. Um, there's neuroethics. When is a person, you know, brain dead is something that is determined by neuroethics and maybe even the intersection with neuro law which is, you know, you might be considering decisions about induced coma and the effect on the brain or brain death in the, in the span of a courtroom. How does that play into legal decisions? Um, there's also neuro art, for instance, for us more art artistically inclined folks. I, I wish I was, but I'm not. <laughs> um, science journalism, neurobiology is one that maybe some of us are inclined to. Um, 
just so many fields overall. Political psychology, I mentioned before. Did I mention before? I think I mentioned before. Uh, political psychology too. So I strongly think that, you know, you don't have to be a science kid to be a neuroscience kid. So that's sort of my perspective. And, you know, I think we have a question in the chat. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, from, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, Rashida, from Rashida. So what kind of careers or jobs could a research path lead to? And are jobs in the research field only in labs or is there anything else? Great question, by the way. That's a really, yeah, I, I didn't say nope to the question, I just realized. Um, that is a wonderful question. And the answer is, you don't just have to work in the lab. Um, one of my mentors, I, I have so many wonderful mentors in my life, so I, I just realized that um, there are multiple people. Um, I'm referring to one person. Uh, so my mentor is a medical professional. She has a MD degree, but she's also involved in research. And her research focuses more on the clinical side. And she's actually who, one of the people who is mentoring me for my brain injury research at the moment. Um, she doesn't have a PhD degree, but she's still involved in research, right? And that's one route. She, she is a doctor, she actively practices, and she is, she's, oh, I, I don't, I actually don't believe that she currently works in any wet lab settings at the moment, more of, you know, uh, clinical side. Uh, enrolling patients and uh, studies, for instance, that too is related to her area of expertise a little bit. I just goes to show, you know, a research path could lead you to medicine, which is one of the more common routes alongside a PhD program. So academia professors at universities, for instance, or excuse me, private research institutions. Um, there's also the wonderful MD PhD blend, which is physician scientists basically it allows you to really be able to bridge both of the clinical and academia settings, academic settings, if you are so inclined in that path. Now, what people also don't really think about too much is industry um, and entrepreneurship and so many other fields in biotech and pharma, for instance. Um, really having that research background can be extremely advantageous, especially as you pursue entrepreneurship, for instance, or working with any sort of biotech startups you'll often see a scientist who has a strong research background. So I honestly, you know, these are just things that I'm thinking off the top of my head. Uh, a lot of people also go into science communication. So science outreach initiatives, you know, educational STEM days, things like that. Also a lot of scientists with formal degrees are also um, involved in that. So at the end of the day, there's a lot out there. And these are just things off the top of my head. Journalism was another one. Um, so really do you know put time into exploring what kind of doors these research experiences can open up for you yeah of course yeah so thank you for that question oh it's actually really cool to hear about the different opportunities and i think we have one question from jade so why did you choose columbia to study neuroscience to be honest, I did not really expect to go to Columbia for university because I, I, from Northern California, and was expecting to stay close to home in good old California. Um, but what really drove me to choose Columbia was, let's see, um, it's a research powerhouse, um, to be put quite frankly. And as someone who was pretty strongly inclined towards research, I really wanted to be able to continue that as well when I was in college. So that, you know, was a driving force for me. I was looking into strong research institutions that could support my interests, allow me to independently develop my own ideas and project proposals and provide me the mentorship where I could go about doing so. Um, so that's for research. Um, the core curriculum is kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to Columbia. Um, as a heavy life sciences and neuroscience student before, um, and I believe we might have talked about this in the podcast episode, I can't quite remember. Um, it's that the core curriculum is heavily humanity centered, which is a wonderful, wonderful rounding out of the experience for a science student. Recently, actually, um, we read a work called City of God by St. Augustine um, for contemporary civilizations. And we actually had a seminar recently 
that connected Augustine's work, which is, you know, from many centuries ago, to neuroscience and the mind. And that was incredibly fascinating to just learn about that. Um, so all these different interdisciplinary connections, Columbia is really the heart of that. Um, the irony is that I think I picked up more on realizing kind of the light bulb of how multidisciplinary neuroscience was after I actually, you know, enrolled at Columbia. So, you know, I had made the decision about Columbia and then later began to develop SN based on previous experiences with neuro, but it really like the, um, the enlightenment um, kicked in when I was actively, you know, had matriculated actively and was enrolled in classes throughout this past year and such. And so that was a big reason too. Um, the aspect of being able to round out my experiences. We're gonna, we're gonna keep moving on in this train. Um, the Zuckerman Institute is a absolute neuroscience powerhouse as well. Um, not quite on campus, it's, it's a few blocks uptown, but it's, it's science outreach, it's science communication, it's just the general atmosphere of the lab and the institution as well is incredible. So I'd highly recommend looking into it, the Zuckerman Institute, kind of like Zuckerberg, but Zuckerman, um, Institute. So that was one. We're going to keep going on. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, the interactions with the graduate schools. So this past year, I actually was um, assisting with research up at the Uptown Medical Campus, which is about 50 blocks from campus, about 20, 20 minute bus ride, I would say shuttle ride. Um, and it's incredibly accessible to young students as well. So all the graduate schools are pretty, intercon pretty interconnected with the undergrad colleges as well. So for context, I attend Columbia College in Columbia University. I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize until they get into college actually, is that there are there is the undergrad college and the graduate schools that fall under the university overall. So keep that in mind. So I'm an, I'm an undergrad sophomore in Columbia College. Look at the timing of this. This is this is low library from Columbia. It's a little wow. origami figure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We we got little origami folding sheets in the mail. But anyways, <laughs> just realized I just had this sitting next to me and thought it would be relevant. So considering all those graduate school interactions as well, I've definitely been able to interact with a variety of neuro students and professionals and gain access to, you know, a medical school that most colleges, it would be far off of campus, maybe quite a few miles away. And, you know, this is just a 20 minute Columbia shuttle right away. So, and also the fact that there is a Columbia shuttle, they're really trying to increase, you know, uh, communication and movement with physical and literal, um, physical and metaphorical um, between these different schools as well. So there was that, oh my God, so many other reasons. There are always cool events going on on campus, like weekly seminars. I can think of five or six happening every single week um, that just, you know, you can pique your interest and go to whatever you wish to go to. Uh, people were incredibly driven to learn, driven to learn. Um, the atmosphere was welcoming and people were there because they wanted to build themselves into stronger, better people and not just, you know, there for the school of having to attend school because the law decrees it. So. I think those are those are big reasons, and yeah. I overall, I think there were also a few neuroscience professionals who are currently at Columbia at the moment who I had read about their work. So you know, doing your research, obviously, um, about what was offered and looking into neuroscience courses. I also really it called to me uh, quite a bit. So that was a very long-winded answer, but hopefully, you know, looking at various aspects of kind of what it can offer, apply to Columbia. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, it sounds amazing. Um, the library, I've actually never seen the library. Was that the library? This is the library. Oh, right. Yeah. I'm going to close up again. Low library is back. It looks so like Greek. <laughs> like, uh -oh. I don't know. <laughs> I don't we know. actually learn, learn about these columns um, in art humanities. I am forgetful because of COVID-19 lockdown brain is just off. But yeah, these are based in um, ancient ancient influence, so. Yeah, so it does really scream um, like the humanities like, <laughs> along sure. with like other STEM um, aspects. So 
Yeah, I think that exhausts the questions for now. So if you have any questions, of course, like Chimai, you said, feel free to email her as well as use the educational neuro questions at advice at siblingneuroscience.org. Um, yeah, so overall, thank you for coming and please visit mindsetc.org under education for this PowerPoint if you need to review anything. And of course, reach out to um, Simply Neuroscience for opportunities, resources, or questions for sure. Yeah, so thank you so much to Jingmai for coming. Yeah, wonderful sharing about research with you guys. It's always super fun to talk about. Uh, yeah, so thank you. And yeah, sorry, I'm being so awkward right now. Uh, <laughs> it's a Friday evening, it's fine. My brain is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>